Our first speaker is somebody who I've only come to know in recent years, but who has been just profoundly influential on me. Many of you know Howard Gardner through his work, his celebrated work as an educator. But many of you also know that Sometimes when you read about somebody or you read somebody's work and you know somebody who's super well known and has had a great influence on a whole school of thought about learning and about growth and development and about the meaning of good work and about truth and beauty and about the nature of multiple intelligences as Howard Gardner has explored all of these topics. Sometimes when you actually meet the guy, it's a, it can be a disappointment, right? And the guy's like, oh, geez, you know, I built up this whole thing. This guy is a genius. He's written all this stuff. And here's the thing, Howard Gardner is as humble as he is transformative. He is as kind as he is wise. He is as open-hearted and adaptable a person as anybody I know who's a child, and I mean that in the best sense. And Howard Gardner is somebody who we're blessed to have with us today, but we are very intentionally wanting to open this first ever convening of Citizen University with his voice. So please join me in welcoming Howard Gardner. You say you want a revolution. Well, you know. Thank you very much, Eric. Good morning, everybody. Citizens University is a terrific undertaking. I think it's already making a difference nationally, and I'm very pleased to be a part of it uh, going forward. Now, um, I have to begin with a confession. Uh, Eric nicely called me adaptable. Uh, but I was not raised in the era of TED Talks or of Twitter. In fact, the confession is, when I was raised, speeches were, differed, were delivered as slowly as Henry Kissinger's Teutonic pace, and they tended to last as long as Fidel Castro's Spanish rants. <laughs> Nonetheless, I will try to prove myself adaptable and to get into the TED spirit. I'm going to do three things this morning. First, I want to talk some about the past work which my colleagues and I have done. Then I want to talk about our fairly recent move to the study and encouragement of good citizenship. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about what we hope to accomplish moving forward. And that, I hope, is where your table discussions can be of help to us. For many years, I was an ordinary empirical researcher in psychology and education, working with colleagues at the university. But about 20 years ago, I became concerned about two things. First of all, some of the ways in which my own work on multiple intelligences was being misused. Uh, the smoking gun, so to speak, was when a state in Australia classified every racial and ethnic group in terms of which intelligences it had and which intelligences it lacked. And uh, I said, you know, I can't just slough this off. I have a responsibility to do something about this. There was also going, something going on on the national scene. And that was that this was a spirit of unbridled market triumphalism, what uh, Eric and his colleague Nick Hanauer call the triumph of machine brain. I have nothing against markets. Like many people, I am a beneficiary. But I was just convinced that you couldn't live in a society where everything was determined simply by its market value, what could be bought and what could be sold. So with two colleagues, whom some of you will know, Bill Damon and Mike Chick sent me high, we initiated almost 20 years ago the Good Work Project, and we were particularly interested in what it meant to be a good worker in various professions. 
in over a decade, we interviewed over 1,200 people in nine different professions. The average interview took about 40 pages of a protocol to analyze, so we have a lot of data on work in the late 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. I'm only going to show three slides today. This is a reduction of a lot of years of work. It is a slide depicting the three components of good work. And they each begin with the letter E. And as you can see, they are excellence, engagement, and ethics. We call this our triple helix, or ENA. Um, you'll recognize the uh, allusion to DNA. And let me ask, how many of you are in education, broadly defined here? Um, about 19%. Uh, um, how many of you are in, <laughs> in law, or politics, or policy? OK, about, uh, a little bit less. Um, if you're in, I'm going to use the notion of a, an educator, a teacher, because that's familiar to everybody. If you're a good worker, you're excellent. You know your stuff. You're engaged. You care. You show up in the morning. You look forward to going to work. You're involved. You don't dread Monday morning. For you, it's the realization of your profession. Third of all, and this is what I focused on particularly, you try to carry out your work in an ethical way. In every profession, ethical dilemmas arise. And the whole notion of an ethical dilemma is it's not obvious what to do. If you're in a class with 30 kids, two kids have tremendous problems, the ethical dilemma is how much time you spend on those two kids and how much time do you spend on the other 28. The good worker doesn't always get it right, but he or she tries to figure out what's the right thing to do in the circumstance. And it's better to have one E than none and two E's than one, but the prototypical good worker has all three E's. Now, the slide you already saw makes the point that if you think about citizenship, as we began to do, you can apply the same analysis. A good citizen knows something about the laws and regulations and civic procedures. He or she cares. I mean, you can know everything, but not give a damn, or slough it off, or push it on somebody else, or just kick the dog, or complain. But the good citizen is engaged. And third of all, the good citizen also tries to figure out what's the right thing to do in a situation. As you may know, um, Eric and Nick talk a lot about self-interest. There's a big difference between self-interest, which is selfish self-interest, only what's good for me in a narrow sense, and a more broadened, rounded sense of what's good for ourselves, for our broader community. So um, we were pleasantly surprised, because we hadn't thought about citizenship, to realize that our analysis of good work, the three E's, the intertwined ENA, also characterized citizenship. And again, it's better to know your stuff than not to know it. It's better to be engaged than not engaged. But if you only use it to pursue numero uno, then in our definition, you're not a good citizenship. You're not a good citizen. So we decided to um, study good citizenship as we had studied good work. And um, I encountered a number of surprises. The first one was that within the world of funding, and when you carry out research, you need funding, citizenship was considered to be a dead field. As somebody told me at a major foundation, there's been nothing interesting done in the area of citizenship in 50 years. This was not what I would call encouraging. Um, but it is, it is important to know how people with resources think about the area of citizenship. Second of all, I learned that in the digital era in which we all live, civics is no longer your grandmother's civics. It's no longer a dusty textbook of the sort that I read in fifth and sixth grade growing up in Scranton, Pennsylvania a long time ago. Nor is it what I did in high school in Scranton um, 
And I actually think it was not a bad use of time. We had to memorize the Constitution. Uh, and that's why Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton always come back to Scranton, because they know that they can find people who know about the articles and sections and so on. Um, but that's not what the new civics is. To get some introduction to the new civics, I was invited to join a MacArthur Foundation network on participatory politics. Um, and I sometimes think I was a member of the control group because everybody else was a digital native and I am a bona fide digital immigrant. Nonetheless, I learned about new views of citizenship, about activism, slacktivism, flashism, the Harry Potter Alliance, <laughs> Dream Youth, Arab Spring. Um, and needless to say, this was not at all reminiscent of the, the grandmother's civics from an earlier era. I also began to think about the three E's of citizenship as I began to learn about these new forms. And um, on the issue of excellence, one of the things that struck me is that the kind of knowledge of laws and regulations and procedures was quite thin among people who practice the new civics. They wouldn't have succeeded in my ninth grade class where we had to memorize the constitutions. There was certainly plenty of engagement, but the engagement tended to come on and go come off. It wasn't steady, but rather very occasion-driven, and it could be very ardent for hours or for a day, and then shut off for uh, a significant period of time. So it was episodic rather than constant. Third of all, and again, this is where our own research focused, um, there was not much concern in my encounter with the new civics in exactly what it was to be ethical and what it was to be non-ethical. And that's because, to put it formulaically, the digital media are a wild west. Nobody has actually thought through issues of trust, of identity, of intellectual property in the way that they more or less have been thought through in a pre-digital era. So we might say not that ethics is absent, but the issues are still very, very vexed, and uh, they, haven't been, they haven't settled at all as the way they did in a pre-digital era. The third thing, which I don't think will make people in this room very happy, but it's important to know, is that for most young people today, the whole talk about this realm is quite toxic. Most young people don't like to hear the word politics, citizenship, patriotism. Um, these are things which are other people do, old people do. It's the stuff that you shut off when it's mentioned in class or on television. Um, on the other hand, activism is more neutral. That's okay. And things like causes, helping, fun are good words. But this is very important for anybody who carries with them some of the old civics in your DNA or in your blood, is you need to be careful about the use of these words with um, unselected young people because they don't um, produce an immediate frisson of pleasure. Um, so we decided to do some of our own work. And what I want to do is talk about some initial findings. This is work carried out with many people, um, led by Carrie James, a longtime colleague, and Katie Davis, also a longtime colleague, who recently moved to Seattle. And what we've been doing in our own empirical work is working both with ordinary, unselected kids, kids who, as it were, have this kind of revulsion at civics talk, and kids who are actively involved in political endeavors, in um, environmental concerns, in immigration reform, and so on. So we have data both from unselected kids and from kids who we would call um, engaged in the new civics. And let me just tell you some of the initial findings and then move to a conclusion. First of all, to do something in civics, you need to have both a cause and a feeling of agency, a feeling of efficaciousness. 
And there is an unfortunate divide in our country. Among the more privileged kids, and this would be many of our own children, there's often a great deal of efficacy of feeling you can do things, but not nearly as frequently is there a cause that you really want to devote yourself to steadily. Um, Oscar Wilde famously said, not to me, um, socialism takes too many evenings, and to take too many evenings, um, you have to have something you really care about. When you go to the um, broader social economic classes, not to the kids with privilege, you often find that they think um, that there are issues that are very important, often in their own neighborhood, often in their own family, but all too often they feel they don't have the efficacy to do something about it. And one big question is whether the new digital media will confer sufficient efficacy so they feel they can be an agent, and of course, the agency has to play out. You can feel you have an agent, but if uh, what you do is, is ignored by everybody, that's going to be frustrating. Um, a second thing that we've discovered is that majority of kids who are involved with um, civics in the sense that I talked about it before do have um, some background in knowing about how the society works, how laws work, and so on. Um, a wonderful example represented here today is the Mikva Challenge from Chicago, but there are similar groups in Boston working in environment and immigration and so on. And what we found is that these young people use the digital media, but they use them instrumentally and transactionally to get things done, just as so you might have used a billboard or radio or television in an earlier era, but they don't tend to come to the causes because of their work with Facebook or um, messing around or um, uh, just uh, uh, having, uh, you know, doing social media things. Third of all, behind young groups of people working on civic issues, you almost always find older people, mentors who are helping people, the younger people, figure out what to do, how to make use of the media, how to be effective, and so on. Um, sometimes these older people provide funding, which is important. Sometimes they provide um, strategies, which are important. Um, and uh, there's a hunger among young people. 84% of kids whom we interviewed said they wish they had more mentoring about how to use the digital media. And the mentoring doesn't mean necessarily from somebody older, it just means from somebody more proficient. So these media are not as self instructive, self-educational, as you might have thought, as I might have thought. Um, a, a fourth finding from Emily Weinstein, who's been working with us, is that young people do not yet have an easy relationship between their online and their offline identities. Sometimes they're completely fused. Sometimes they're completely disconnected, one kind of an online identity so, a completely different offline identity, and sometimes they're even fragmented between how you use Twitter, how you use Facebook, how you use a blog. Um, I'm not saying that any of these is right or wrong, but what I am saying is working out your, of your own civic identity and your own human identity, which are not necessarily the same things, is still a work in progress for many young people. Um, I want finally to say a bit of work uh, a bit of words about my own thinking in this area. A few years ago, I came up with a distinction between what I called neighborly morality and the ethics of roles. Neighborly morality is how you deal with um, the people in your neighborhood. Um, in Eric's and Nick's book, they talk about the Dunbar number, the 150 people who uh, you can expect to know just from your neighborhood. Um, the Bible, the Ten Commandments, the, uh, golden, the golden rule are enough to let you know how to deal with people near you. You don't steal from them, you don't lie to them, you don't commit adultery, you don't kill them, you don't disrespect them. This is very different from the ethics of roles. And here I go back to the two slides, the role of the citizen and the role of the worker. These are not natural roles. You have to learn what it means to be a professional, what it means to be an engineer, an architect, a lawyer, 
or doctor, and you have to learn what it means to be a citizen. Everybody lives in the neighborhood, everybody lives in community, but a citizen involves certain understandings, certain assumptions, and most important, certain kinds of responsibilities. There's a famous quip from Gandhi. He was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, it's a good idea. Somebody should try it. Um, and I think that when we think about citizenship, we have to have in our mind models, whether it's models from the 18th or 19th century New England town meeting or communities in Sweden or Denmark which work very civically or the kind of endeavor that uh, is originating here in Citizen University, we need to have a positive model of what civics, what citizenship is about. It's not something that you get just because you happen to live on the block. I'm coming to the end of my allotted time, at least on this platform, and I want to tell you about the two issues that my colleagues and I are going to be pursuing going forward. Number one is what is the history of individuals who've become intelligently involved in citizenship? Individuals who really do embody those three excellence, ethic, and engagement. And how can we learn from those positive models to help other young people become good citizens? The second question we want to do is unpack the notion of the word good. Because even in this room, people have very different senses of what it means to be good. There's a Latin question, quio bono? To whom is the good? And how people decide among competing goods and which good are worth really going for and which goods are of secondary importance and shouldn't be emphasized as much is an ongoing debate, it's an ongoing struggle. Nobody knows the answer but it's extremely important not to assume that just because I think a certain thing about Wikipedia or I think a certain thing about an Arizona law or I think a certain thing about Aaron Schwartz that everybody else thinks the same thing. The moral of the story, you've noticed that I'm a gardener, um, but I'm a gardener without an E in it. I'm G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E Eric, of course, writes about the importance of having gardeners, but he's got an E, right? G-A-R-D-E-N-E-R. And I want to suggest that that single E there represent excellence, engagement, and ethics, and that you will think about it. And if you're curious for more, you can go to our website, The Good Project, and learn all about the E's. Thank you very much.